In Jesus, you are fully known and fully forgiven and fully loved. This is why Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Good morning, Trail family. How are we doing today? Good, 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 good. I get the privilege of looking at Philippians 3 today. And as you guys are turning to Philippians 3, once you get there, hold your place and turn with me to Matthew chapter 16. You see, a genuine disciple is a person who will forsake all things of this world. He will forsake all things of this world by losing their life and dying to self rather than seeking after the things of this world. Turn with me to Matthew 16. We're going to look at just a couple verses, starting in verse 24. Jesus told his disciples, I want you to understand, Jesus is speaking to his disciples at this point. He's looking at them, and he's having a good heart-to-heart with them. Listen to what he says. Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Verse 26. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Friends, this is an amazing, humbling passage. You see, it encourages us as believers to live in one of two ways. Like I said earlier, often people mistakenly use this and apply it to unbelievers. But Jesus is talking to his disciples right now. He's talking to people who say, I am following Christ. You can either live, one, the carnal way, which is the way of the world, where a believer lives for themselves, not understanding that the life we live on earth does dictate our future role in heaven. Or two, the spiritual way, which is the way of Christ, understanding the world is not our home and only things done in the spirit will last for eternity. You see, if our life work is carried out in the flesh, it's going to be burned up. It'll be lost. If we build up our rewards on earth instead of in heaven, if we delight in the praises of men rather than that of our Lord, we'll have nothing to show of it. But if our life is carried out in spirit, denying self, and living for Christ. When our works are tried in the fire, they will come out as gold and silver and precious stones. You see, the life lived in spirit and truth may not gain wealth and praises of the world, but they result in a share of heavenly rewards. As we read Philippians 3, we're going to see 
Jesus' echoing throughout the entire chapter. I titled today's lesson, Eyes on the Prize. And we're going to look at Philippians chapter 3 all the way to Philippians 4, 1. Let's pray and let's read the passage. Father, thank you so much for this time that we get to open up your word. And as we think about what it means to live for you, as we think about what it means to die to ourself and live for you, I pray through, through Paul's letter, through your word, your scripture, that it penetrates our heart, mind, and soul. That today, as we read, as we understand, as we get to know you better, Father, meet us here. We're going to look at our, our, our accomplishments. We're going to be looking at our failures. But God, let us never take our eyes off of you, the main prize. In Jesus' name, amen. Philippians chapter 3, and I'm going to read the whole passage, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to start to dissect it. Sound good? Finally, my brothers, verse 1, <clears throat> rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me, and it's safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, Paul says, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, I was a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Verse 7, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead." Verse 12, not that I have already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Verse 17, brothers, join in imitating me. Keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. They glory in their shame with mind set on earthly things. 
but our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and I long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. Amen. Amen. So, let's take a look at this passage, shall we? Philippians 3. Paul is transitioning from reminding them of Christian doctrine to actually exhorting them to Christian living. Okay? The first chapter, Kelly titled it, The, uh, the, the Joyous Person in Prison. The Happiest Person in Prison. We have to remind ourselves that as Paul is writing these words, he is in prison. He's not walking around. He's in prison. And that mindset, that change, look at what he says. Finally, my brothers. Now, note to self, a lot of people think that when he says finally, he's wrapping things up. Not true. You see, Paul, Paul is saying what he wrote in chapter 2, worthy of the gospel, live your life worthy of the gospel, it ushers it right into chapter 3. You live your life worthy of the gospel, you keep your eyes on the prize, you keep your, your life heavenly towards Christ and Christ alone. You're going to come through trials. You're going to go through the ups and downs of life. And there's no way that we can get around that. If we had time, we could look at Jesus. The night he is betrayed is talking the upper room discourse. And he looks at his disciples and goes, you will face trials. But take heart. I will have overcome. Paul, in his wisdom, writes yet again to rejoice. That does not mean put on your fake smile. That does not mean, you know, oh, yep, pretend I'm okay. Fake it till you make it. I mean, some of these are actually, you know, things that we all do. But Paul is saying, no, 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 hold on. Remember Remember the hope you have that is eternal, not here like a drop in the bucket of life. You see, a lot of times we lose sight of that. A lot of times we lose hope because we take our eyes off of Christ. And so as Paul is writing in prison, he says, rejoice in the Lord. To write these things to you, to write the same things to you, is no trouble. No trouble for me. And it's safe for you. You see, Paul is so unapologetic in repeating his call to rejoice in the Lord always. Because it stabilizes us as Christians. It causes us to take a second pause and go, what am I really focused on? He then says, do you know Christ? If we look at verses 2 through 6, let's take a look at it. Verse 2, look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. He's, he's, He's asking them, guys, Who are you hanging with? Who are you looking at? Now, when we hear the term dog in America, that's not the term that they were thinking here. The dogs in this passage, and actually even in Revelation, in this passage, they were awful, filthy, 
they fought each other. They bit anybody that came close. They were not, quote unquote, man's best friend. So, so get that cute little puppy out of your mind. Instead, think of the most grotesque, evil looking canine that would scavenge. Yeah, that's what he's saying. And he's actually calling people that. He says, look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. My friends, we will be known by our fruit. That means we're going to be known by our good fruit, and the evildoers will be known by their evil fruit. And so look at the person. What is the fruit that they are producing? Verse 3, for we are the circumcision. Paul was probably the only person, he, he was Jew, so he was circumcised. Remember, the church of Philippi, they were Gentiles. And so we don't have time to turn there, but you can jot down Galatians 6.15, where it's saying, guys, we are separated. We are special we are set apart. And that's what he means by here. We are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus. Do you know Christ? And not just, have you heard of Christ? Not just, I think I could point him out in a lineup type of thing. Not, not that. I'm talking about, do you abide? Do you remain? Do you know him? Do you know how he thinks? How he loves? How he lives? My friends, to know Christ is to serve like Christ. Verse 3 clearly states that. Look at what it says. We are set apart, we are the circumcision who worshiped by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus. We put no confidence in the flesh. To know Christ means to set set yourself apart from the world and serve Christ. Romans 12, 1 and 2, incredibly powerful passage. It says to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing. This is your act of worship. This is the way you ought to live. This is the way you serve. By loving God. By serving Him. Not serving, not looking at ourselves. The second thing about do you know who Christ is? is how do you boast? What do you put your faith in? What do you put your stock in? Who gets the glory in your life? Look at verse 4. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Paul is saying, guys, I have I have the resume upon resumes. You you want to go toe-to-toe? Let's go toe-to-toe. But instead, he's going, no, 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 no. Who is getting the glory? A Christian life is a life-exalting Christ. Hold your place real quick in Philippians and turn just a couple chapters to Galatians. Paul is finishing his letter to the church of Galatia. And he says this in chapter 6, verse 14. But far be it from me to boast. Again, 
Paul is saying, man, if you really want to go toe-to-toe, I can, I can go toe-to-toe with you. But listen to what I boast. Listen to how I live. Listen to how I say this is the most important thing in my life. Except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. My friends, how do you serve? You can turn with me back to Philippians 3. Do you serve a life devoted to Christ? Who do you boast? How do you boast? Who gets the glory in your life? Third thing, how do you know who Christ is? Who do you put your faith in? Who do you put your stock in? Listen to what Paul says, okay? He adds, so he, he's saying, look at my resume. You, you, you really want to talk resumes? Let's talk resumes here. Verse 5, all right? He was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, A Hebrew of Hebrews, all right? He could boast in rituals. He could boast in the race and ethnicity of himself. Let's keep reading. As to the law, a Pharisee, verse 6. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, I was blameless. My friends, how do you know Christ? Well, first of all, you ask yourself, who are you serving? If you're serving yourself, that's not dying to oneself, that's that's living for oneself. If you're serving Christ, you're getting to know who Christ is, how he thinks, how he loves, how he lives. The second thing on do you know Christ is how you boast. Are you saying, hey, did you, did you just see what I did? Look at what I did. I did that. Or instead, are you saying, look, look to the cross. Look at the example that was made. And finally, How do you know Christ? You look at your own life. What do you put your faith? What do you put your faith in? Are you putting your faith in rituals? Oh man, I got to make sure that I do these things. Are you putting your faith in your race? How about faith in your job? It's very easy to find our identity in our jobs. Traditions, got to keep, got to keep. And you just pile upon pile of law, and it just buries you. The zeal, the passion that we have, our works. My friends, as it says in 3 through 6, it's really easy to ask yourself, do you know Christ? But in verses 7 through 11, Paul encourages the church, how do you know Christ? Let's read it. Whatever gain I had. Stop right there. I love that. He just finishes saying, okay, resume upon resume. Look at what I've done. And then he goes, all of it. All of it. Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as a loss because of the surpassing worth 
of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Well, my friends, what is important in your life today? We see this beautifully pinned by Paul in prison, reminding the church of Philippians to rejoice, to focus our eyes back on Christ. Yes, we're going to go through life. Yes, we're going to go through the ups and downs. But who are we serving? What are we boasting about? What are we putting our faith in? He's saying, if you're doing anything other than Christ, what good is it? How can you hold on to that? In fact, I, I, love, I love what it says. Keep reading here. I count it as loss for the sake of Christ. Verse 8, indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus for my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Now, okay, ESV says filth, rubbish. The King James Version says dung. And that's just, I mean, I I don't want to sound crass here, but that is a great visual image for us. As we ask ourselves, how do you know Christ? Well, first of all, you're weighing out what you see is important in your life. You got families and you got jobs and you got bills and you I mean that the list goes on and on. And, and it could be a good thing. And Paul goes, but wait, 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 wait. What's more important? What's eternal? What's life giving? What's life changing? the gospel of Jesus Christ. Everything else is dung. At the risk of sounding crass, he basically calls it dog crap. I mean, is that not a, a wonderful mental image? He says it's all dog crap compared to loving and knowing Christ. You see... Let me remind you again who Paul was. He was a zealous Pharisee who actually authorized the martyrs, persecuted the early church. And then Acts, on his way to persecute the church in Damascus, he gets a real encounter with the one true living God. He gets this amazing eye-opening and he goes, everything else is nothing compared to God. Everything else is nothing compared to Christ. Can we see that? Do we understand that? I don't, I don't know, because so, sometimes when we come in here, when we come in and, and, and we're surrounded by godly men and women, it's like, okay, but then I don't know if you're like me. I come in and I sing the worship songs and it's awesome, but then in the back of my head, I still have things that, okay, don't forget, you got to do this, and this is important. And, and it distracts me from what is really important. It takes away. It robs me of my joy. Because I'm not focused on God. I'm not focused on his truth. I'm not focused on his way. I'm focused on mine. And when he clearly states, clearly states, really? All of it. All of it's rubbish compared to the cross, the good news, the hope we have 
in Christ Jesus our Lord. That should excite us in a way that should just be like a wildfire in our hearts, minds, and souls. That we, some of us are in this room, we have tried to live the perfect life. We've checked off all the boxes. We've done all the good things. And yet we feel this pressure and this weight of, I'm not good enough. I've blown it. Maybe some of us in this room, we've heard the gospel, but we're still running. We are still running from it, going, mm, I, I want to see what the world has to offer. My friends, if that's you, stop. Please stop and really hear what Paul is saying to this early church. Hear what Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew. You could be the richest man in the world. You could have everything. But if you don't know Christ, you've lost it all. If you're living for your carnal self instead of the one that will last forever, what good is it? Verse 9 is extremely important because it helps us see clearly how one becomes a Christian. You can't do it on your own. You need Christ. You see, to know Christ, you have to be justified by Christ. You have to be sanctified. These are some big, big words, and, and don't worry, I'll go back and I'll explain it. Justified by Christ is being righteous by looking and seeing that as we stand before the Lord and the Lord judges our lives, what does he see? Look at what it says in verse 9. Actually, it's starting right in the middle of a sentence, so let, let's, let's jump up here, okay? Part of verse 8. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. In order that I may gain Christ, I may gain Christ, I may know Christ and be found in him, verse 9, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God, it depends on faith. My friends, if you forget everything I say today, that's okay, we'll say it again. No, if you forget everything that I say, rejoice, okay, rejoice. I, I was trying to pull a pull here. That went way over our heads. If you forget everything I say today, understand this. Your faith has to be in Christ, in Christ alone. You and I are sinners Wow, Garrett, this is just an amazing Sunday morning lift me up motivational talk. Guys, I hope it's not a motivational talk. I want truth. And the truth is this is that if you and I keep trying to live for ourselves, God will give us ourselves. Instead, we need to be righteous in Christ. And that righteous in Christ is putting our faith in him, knowing that he lived the life that you and I could not live. He died the death that you and I deserved. And then he defeated death and now sits at God's right hand. You see, that righteousness, that truth, us coming to the Father through the Son 
through the Holy Spirit saying, here, here I am, I'm broken. I can't do it on my, I can't do it by myself anymore. That's what Paul is saying to the church, going, guys, don't put your faith in yourself. Don't put your faith in your stocks, in your, in your rank, in, in your ethnicity, in your job, in your, and he made the list. He goes, instead, put your faith and your hope in Christ because in him only you can be justified. In him you will be righteous. And then in verse 10, we're sanctified, we're set apart. So once we put... Once we know Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, verse 10, I may know him and the power of his resurrection and share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Guys, we are going to be set apart. Verse 10 speaks specifically of sanctification, set apart. If we know who Christ is, we are then set apart. And then the third big word, we're glorified. Glorification. Look at verse 11. By that means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. If you aren't a Christian... You need to be justified. You need to be made righteous. So when God looks at you, he sees his son. To be counted righteousness before God. Otherwise, you will face condemnation. And I I don't say these things as, as a bait and switch. I don't say these things to just dump on you guys. I say these things because it is so true. If you guys knew the joy that we have in Christ, the life that we have in Christ, the excitement that we have in Christ. Please, if you don't know who Christ is, at the end of the service, come on down. Talk with me. We'll have people up here to pray with. This is one of the most important decisions, the most important decision you will ever make. We're here for a reason, guys. We're not here for a club. We're not, we're not, we're here because we hope to think and live and love more like Christ because we realize that he is the way, the truth, and the life. If you are a Christian, like Paul, we got to pursue a better understanding, a better knowledge of Christ in this life. And that's where we get to the next few verses. You see, the next few verses, I love this, is a self-examination. Oh, yeah, you would love this, Garrett. You're just strange. Self-examination? Why? Guys, as we study this text... We should be provoked. Thanks. I should be... No, no, hold on. You shouldn't be condemned. If you're a Christian, you should not be condemned. But we might be convicted. There's a huge difference between conviction and condemnation. The Christian is free from judgment. Remember, we just talked about justification. We're made righteous through Christ. Romans 8.1 clearly states that. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus our Lord. That means you and I, even though we have a past, even though maybe some of us have made a mistake coming to this room today, we are justified in Christ. But when God convicts us, it's so evident of his love for us. So don't leave today thinking, oh man, Garrett, that that was just just a condemning message. No, my friends, I pray it's a convicting message because we hear, we see, we understand the love of the Father 
through his son for us. It's proof, as we started in Philippians chapter 1, that he will bring our salvation to completion. He's not going to let us keep running and living for ourselves. And so, this is where we're at. Verse 12, humbly realize and acknowledge you're not perfect. Easy said, I, I, I can do that. Listen to what it says. Not that I've already obtained this or I am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. My friends, in your self-examination, do you think you're perfect? Well, the answer would be realize and acknowledge you're not there yet. But that doesn't give us an excuse. The other self-examination question I, I have for you is are you, keep, are you keeping going? Are you still trying? Listen to what it says in 13. Actually, I'm going to read 12 through 14 again, okay? Not that I have already obtained this or already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Guys, that is so comforting. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, I forget what lies behind and I strain forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. My friends, realize, acknowledge you're not perfect, but keep striving for it. Pursuit, okay? Look at the pursuit. Hold your place oh, quickly. Hold your place and turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Towards the end of the Bible, listen to what the author of Hebrews says. Very similar to what Paul, very similar to what Jesus says. Hebrews chapter 12 says this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses... Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder, perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. My friends, in your self-examination, do you realize and acknowledge that you aren't perfect? But ask yourself, are you keeping going? Are you pursuing him? My friends, keep running. Look at what it says. Forgetting, verse 13, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. In your running, in your pursuit of God, does the past affect you? You see what Paul did here? He actually commented on that. He goes, I could, I could totally say I can't be effective for the ministry because I persecuted the church. He could also say, I can't be effective for ministry because look at what I've already done. Look at my accomplishments. But if you and I as Christians are to be focused on Christ, that means the past is exactly that, the past. And our eyes should be on the future. Our eyes should be straining, running forward. Have you ever tried to run You're out there, you're running, and you look behind you, and you keep running. How many of y'all fall down? Go ahead. Let's be exactly. If you're looking behind you as you are running, 
you're going to biff it. But instead, understand that, yes, the past is there. Understand that the past does affect us. But that's not what's important. What's important is the future that we have in Christ. And in verse 14, self-examination, purpose. Do you have purpose in your life? Look at what it says. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. One thing, keep pressing on for the hope and the future that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We don't have time to turn there, but you can jot down Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus looks at his disciples and he goes, I want you to be salt and light. I want you to be different from the world. I want, I want you to be a beacon so people see you and not praise you for your works, but praise the Father for the work he has done. Self-examination. Have you lost the wonder of Christ? Verses 12 through 14. Don't lose that wonder. Don't lose that joy. For some of us here, we have been Christian many, many years. For some of us here, we get into our routine. This is my seat. You don't sit in my seat. Guys, if you ever want to go to a different church, just sit on the other side of the sanctuary. I t- you think I'm joking, but it's really funny. I mean, he's like, oh, you go, wow. My friends, don't lose the wonder of Christ. Don't lose the wonder of the gospel. For those that are Christians, Remember when you first truly accepted Christ as Lord and your Savior, the weight that was lifted off, the joy that you had. Why, my friends, are we starting to pile on tradition or rank or things of this world and not kingdom things? For those that aren't Christians, I encourage you yet again to know Christ, to accept him as Lord and personal Savior. You see, never forget your first love. It was God. And it wasn't because we first loved him, but he first loved us. In fact, it says in Romans, while we were still enemies... He loved us. There's nothing in this world that compares. Self-examination. Question number four. Are you a team? Or are you trying to do it alone? My friends, you could be the most holiest monk on the hill farthest away. What good is that? for the kingdom of God. Instead, listen to what he says in verses 17 through 19. Brothers, join in imitating me. Keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. My friends, follow faithful examples. Verses 18 and 19, ask yourself, who's giving you wisdom? Look at what it says. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. They glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. My friends, these are the pretenders. Remember what I said earlier, we will be judged by our fruit you will see them by what they produce. But if we are constantly surrounding ourselves with those pretenders, 
with the people that are encouraging us to think more earthly than kingdom think, how do you think it's going to affect the way we think? So yes, I am asking us to be a team. Yes, I am asking us to surround yourself with godly people that help you have a global mission. Okay, this, is, this does not mean that you just cut off. This means that you surround yourself. You're getting wisdom from godly people that are helping you to think and live like Jesus. And then as a team, we go out. Or are we surrounding ourselves with pretenders and people that really want to make sure that, that you have the white picket fence, the American dream? The grass that is about a half, I mean, I, we, could, we could go on and we could tease. But the truth and the reality is this. Are you following faithful examples? Or are you allowing earthly think? to get into your head. Surround yourself with people that encourage you to think like Jesus. Self-examination. Do you live in light of your everlasting citizenship? Let that question sink in a little bit. How do you live? Verses 20 and 21. But our citizenship is in heaven. In Matthew, Jesus is talking to his disciples and goes, what are you focused on? The things of this world where you could get robbed, pickpocketed, rust, fires come, burn everything down, Or are your eyes on earthly, are, are heavenly things where nothing can take it away? I know this is a pretty heavy message, and I know it's a pretty powerful one too, but it boils down to asking yourself, in what world are you living for? If your eyes are on the prize for this earthly kingdom, I'm sorry. (laughs) You may have lots of cool toys, but this earthly kingdom is but a drop in the bucket compared to eternity. How do you keep your eyes focused on God? Well, I got three questions for you. The first one is this. What things in your life do you need to let go in order to prioritize Christ? Oh, talk about self-examination. But it's a great question. Not because I wrote it but it's one that gets us thinking. What things in my life do I need to let go in order to prioritize knowing Christ? You see, to prioritize knowing Christ more deeply, the distractions, the multiple earthly pursuits, the things that do not align with thinking, living, and loving like Jesus. Philippians 3 said it very clearly. Whatever gain I had, I count it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the worth, the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Is he the most important thing in your life? Second thing that we can ask ourselves on how we keep our eyes focused on Christ 
is how do you guard against the legalism, the moralism, the, 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 the different stocks that you and I put our faith in? Instead, in? instead of embracing the freedom that is found in Christ, in Christ alone. Galatians chapter 5 verse 1 says this, freedom, for freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. My friends, you might have been a Christian for a long time, and, and, and coming into this room, you think about it, and you go, man, I have added so much weight to my shoulders. I have added traditions, legalism, rank, fill in the blank. I have accidentally taken my eyes off of Christ, and in fact, we have slipped under and lived back under the yoke of slavery, the yoke of, I think I can do it better than Christ. That's what that question is asking. How do you guard against yourself instead of the freedom you have in Christ? My friends, Jesus is the best master ever. It says in Matthew, he says, Come to me, all who are tired and weary, and I will will give you rest. Quit yoking yourself to the things of this world. Quit weighing yourself down so much that you can't live for God. And then the third question. In what ways can you pursue spiritual growth in what ways can you pursue maturity? In what ways can you start walking with the Lord? You see, spiritual growth is an ongoing, every day, day in, day out, way of life. A friend of mine said, Garrett, for the man... The dream is this, one and done. I looked at him and he goes, it's like this. A grenade gets thrown into the room. One person, you jump on it, you die. It's great. And I kind of looked at him like, okay, you're kind of crazy, but that's okay. He goes, no, 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 no. A real Christian will do this. Instead of the one and done, which he has called some of us to do, but he has called all of us to go take that $1,000 bill and cash it for dimes. And every day, you give of yourself. You pick up the cross and you follow Christ. Alistair Begg said this, being a Christian is more than just an instantaneous conversion. It is a daily process whereby you grow to be more and more like Christ. My friends, following Jesus is the best lifelong decision you can make. In chapter 4, verse 1 of Philippians, it says this, Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and I long for, my joy and crown, stand firm, thus in the Lord, my beloved. Stand firm on the Lord, not anything else. As the worship team comes up here to do one last song, I want to end with this thought. For some of us, this has been a good reminder. Just like Paul, it's no trouble to bring it to your attention. In fact, it's safe for us all to remind ourselves of who 
we put our joy in, who we put, who we focus on. For some, this might be the first time that you have faced this decision of knowing Christ. My friends, is he Lord and Savior? Or is he a genie that you sometimes call out or blame? When you have your eyes on the prize, is it earthly thinking or kingdom think? Let's stand, we'll pray, and we'll end with a song. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for the example that you have set. That no matter what we do, if it's not focused on you, it's rubbish. No matter what we've gained, no matter what we've tried to do on this earth for ourselves, it's nothing. But yet here you here you came and you loved us so much that you gave your son to save us so that we would look at our lives and realize that we can't do it on our own. Father, forgive us for sometimes, a lot of times, thinking that we are more important than you. Thank you for the way, the truth, and the life that is in your son. And if any of us should ever falter, I pray that we would just call out to you and you would meet us there. In Jesus' name, amen.